Welcome to Solving the Kubernetes Networking API Rubik's Cube. Hey, yeah, so I'm Leo Lieberman. I'm a real bit engineer at Google, uh, mostly active in the Gateway API community, and I'm a maintainer of a small tool called Ingress to Gateway, uh, which helps people migrate Ingress uh, configurations to Gateway API. Hi, my name is Doug Smith. I am an engineer at Red Hat, and I am involved in the Network Plumbing Working Group, as well as uh, CNI, the Container Network Interface. Hey, everyone. My name is Surya Sitaraman. I'm an engineer working at Red Hat on OpenShift Networking. I contribute to SIG Network, mostly in the network policy area. So very happy to be here at KubeCon with all of you. And I'm Shane. Uh, I'm an engineer at Red Hat with both Doug and Surya, and I work with Lior on Gateway API and Upstream. I'm also a SIG Network Chair and a maintainer of Gateway API. Just to get a read of the room a little bit, um, raise your hand if you're here because you already do quite a bit with Kubernetes networking. Okay. Raise your hand if you're here because of AI ML workloads. Interesting. Raise your hand if you're here and you're completely new to all of it and you're like just interested in whatever is going on here, networking. <laughs> okay, and that is the majority, okay. Cool. So we'll start by just giving an overview of SIG network, um, subprojects and working groups and some of the things that connect to SIG network that aren't exactly under it. So there's a lot of subprojects in SIG network. It's a particularly busy SIG. Uh, here's a sample of some of those. Gateway API, network policy, and multi-network you may have heard of. There's a lot more, and if you're interested in seeing the breadth of it, hit that QR code and it takes you to our README where you can see everything that we have under our purview. Outside of those things, we also connect with the container network interface, CNI, Doug works on that, um, which is a, the standard for configuring network interfaces for containers. It's how network providers plug into Kubernetes. We also have the K8's Network Plumbing Working Group, which we kind of put it, wanted to put a special mention here. This is where you might see things like Maltus and stuff like that show up quite a bit. Um, and more lately, or more, uh, m more recently, the working group serving and device management working groups, which are mostly focused on things related to AI workloads, have been having intersections with networking, which we're gonna talk about, including the LLM instance gateway and the device management working group is doing DRA, dynamic resource allocation. And these have some overlap with networking that we want to kind of dig into. And we'll start at the infrastructure level. Where is the intersection today of AI and networking? Like where do these connect? Doug, could you tell us a little bit more about that? Totally, so I really wanted to start here by kind of setting the stage with what's required on the AI ML side, because it's kind of driving what's happening with networking today and this evolution. So I kind of wanted to show this diagram that kind of asks the question of which problem are we trying to solve? So DRA is dynamic resource allocation. And essentially, the issue that's trying to be addressed is what happens if you have workloads that have a dependency on an exhaustible hardware resource? So in the AIML world, we often think of workloads, pods, that might need to use a GPU. So if you've got a workload that needs to be scheduled to a node, and when I say scheduled, I mean that it's put on the proper load. So of course, this is something that Kubernetes is awesome with overall, and a reason that we know and love Kubernetes is for its scheduler. So if there it happens to be a case where you've got a number of GPUs and you've got workloads that have already utilized those workloads, how do we get that pod to the right node? So what dynamic resource allocation does is tries to say, okay, let's look at what's uh, used right now, and if something is already used, then I can't put the, the workload there. So in this diagram, you'll see it'll wind up on one of the nodes that has these green boxes and available resource. So going a little bit further here, I wanna ask the question of what relation does this have to networking? And basically the gist is number one, 
the AIML trend is not going anywhere, and the dynamic resource allocation is a train that has left the station and is not going to stop anytime soon. So that's the first part. But the second part is really that in the networking world, we also have situations that require exhaustible resources as well. So uh, kind of the classic example would be SRILV. So that's single root IO virtualization. And essentially, if you have a network card that's SRILV capable, it means that you're going to have something called virtual functions. And these in kind of the most standard use case will be kind of represented as network interfaces. So you would need your workload to go somewhere that has a VF, a virtual function available, and then that'll be exhausted. So similarly, we uh, have that exhaustible resource there. And what one thing that's happened recently with DRA is there's kind of a new, newer iterations of DRA coming out from a group called the Device Management Working Group. And they're working on what you'll often hear referred to as structured parameters for DRA. And this is kind of a richer way to express what your workload might need. So one problem that the device management working group is looking at is what if I need to have a um, partial, partial usage of a resource? So envision you've got a um, GPU that has 24 gigs, which would be like consumer scale, but uh, and you have two workloads that use 12 gigs. Uh, often right now what you would see is that you would just allocate a whole 24 gig GPU to that particular workload, but you could use it more efficiently by being able to kind of uh, provision multiple workloads on the same GPU. So. That's one thing that they're looking at, but when this proposal first came out, they started to show these examples where there was not only GPUs being allocated, but also network resources being utilized. Part of that that is um, happening is that for some of these like super scale cases, we have both GPU and network interfaces that are reliant on one another, and they need really high bandwidth, and they need high performance computing uh, considerations. So like NUMA alignment, making sure that you've got the um, resources uh, lined up on the hardware so that they can work uh, properly at scale. This really got a lot of people going on what we really uh, need to have um, for networking. And so one thing that was identified was that in the kind of classic way that you would um, do some networking in Kubernetes, you may need to have some status information about the network that you've attached to. So envision like an IP address and your workload might need to know about that IP address. So ACAP was recently merged um, by uh, Lionel, who uh, joins us today too. Um, he put together this CAP, and it's going to enable a lot of cases for networking by having this status information. Um, further from that, uh, Lionel has also started an effort that is DRA plus CNI, and CNI is kind of the like what we know and love for networking in Kubernetes, and we want to see how that evolves. And last but not least, often these uh, situations involve multi-networking, so attaching to additional networks. And Suri is going to chat with us about that. So multiple networks has a, a lot of use cases, right, in networking. And traditionally, the Kubernetes networking model says that all pods should be able to talk to all pods. The communication is completely open. And by default, they're all attached to this one single overlay network. But we might want more than one interface inside the pod for various use cases like security purposes, 
isolation to be able to group workloads in multiple networks within your cluster. Or you might have performance use cases, like Doug was mentioning, specific hardware that's available only on those specific secondary networks. So all of this is like wide range of use cases present. But right now, we have our um, ecosystem project, Network Plumbing Working Group, Doug is a, is a part of that. And we use network attachment definitions as one of those ways to be able to create secondary networks and attach pods to those networks. But we also have a sub-project within the SIG network called the SIG Network Multi-Network sub-project. And that is trying to come up with uh, out-of-tree CRD to be able to create network as an entity in your cluster, which is pretty cool. Because then you can have multiple networks and be able to attach and tell, be able to attach your pods to each of these networks, right? How many of you here have use cases for multiple networks? In yeah, and do you, do you use NADs? How do you achieve these? Multis. Multis, yeah, right? So, sorry, OV, yeah. We want to try to bring all these communities together into SIG network, and we have a lot of effort going on in, in that area. But another, how does this all tie back to AIML, right? When you do inference, when you're doing requests, when you're doing training, you might want that dedicated network the secondary network, you don't want that to be a part of your infra network almost always, right? So there's there's all these little puzzle pieces, these Rubik's Cube pieces which are falling together on how you can somehow achieve those niche use cases which are way beyond when the, when the initial networking started in Kubernetes many, many years ago, like 10 years ago. And w again, the next stage to all of this is to be able to make the existing Kubernetes APIs multi-network aware. So services, gateways, network policies, admin network policies. So all of these are today working on the assumption that pods are part of that default network, right? So it's much more than just having multiple networks. It's also about gluing of all of these APIs and making these aware. And to tie all that back to DRA, like Doug was mentioning, Lionel is doing the resource status, re resource claim resource, and the resource status, which tells you to, which tells you exactly which net device to choose from, right? So, like like shown in this diagram, you have all these green boxes, which are the, the resources that are available on those nodes, the virtual NICs, or you might also have other parameters, right? You might want to be able to attach your your pod to a specific VLAN or a subnet or a secondary network, which is not available on all nodes, but on specific nodes. So it's again going back to that scheduling problem. So we can use DRA, the new improvements that are coming in, and then also leverage this with the multiple network CRD, right? So all of this is in, in general like helping with taking us a step further in enhancing everything we have to be able to do AIML workloads in Kubernetes network. So that's a bit of what's going on at the infrastructure level when you're doing your uh, training and inference workloads and need to get resources for them, um, in particular networking resources. We also have some things going on at the application level. So we're doing some things with inference-based routing, and Lior will tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, so <clears throat> um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Gateway API and the LLM instance gateway, which helps with that. Um, but I first wanted to start uh, with what is Gateway API very briefly. Um, and uh, Gateway API is basically positioned as the next generation of Ingress API. It brings a lot of the Ingress functionality and um, <clears throat> provide a more portable way uh, for doing uh, routing and uh, various other features. And it currently provides a lot of um, routing APIs, mostly L7 currently. But we're definitely looking for more feedback to understand if uh, L4 routing is something that is requested, is needed, um, and uh, we could uh, incorporate that to, uh, to the project. Um, now, I want to mention that we already have over 25 implementations of this API. Um, and uh, there's no default implementation. Um, so unlike a lot of other Kubernetes projects, um, uh, you'd have to install an implementation in order uh, to get the functionality. Um, so if you want to uh, quickly scan this barcode, you'll get to the website where you see all of the implementation, some conformance level, and un to understand what, what exactly you could install and use. And um, next, I'm going to talk about the LLM instance gateway and the intersection uh, with gateway API. So uh, the project is officially sponsored by uh, uh, Working Group Serving. 
um, and um, it has it has um, intersection with Gateway, and we're going to talk about how it is built with Gateway API in a minute. But essentially, what this project is doing is it's doing tailored AI routing. Um, so you could do semantic routing by looking at a body, and um, there is some option to uh, configure uh, operational objectives like latency for inference requests. Um, and um, if you go to the next slide chain, we're going to see a little bit um, about a problem. But first, I want to really, really just um, 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 put everyone on the same page. So the NLM instance gateway um, is standardizing on LoRa. So it basically optimized for um, backends that has LoRa adapters uh, in them. LoRa stands for low rank adaption, adaptation, sorry. And what it is essentially is uh, just a layer of um, very uh, small parameters that could optimize a model for specific tasks. So it reduces the need to retrain a model uh, for, uh, to be optimized for a task by just loading uh, this lower adapter. Um, and we obviously have different lower adapters that could optimize for different tasks. Um, so we could definitely get a response uh, much faster and uh, much more efficiently. So if I uh, walk you through the problem real quick, so um, we get an inference request, right? And let's say we have three pods, and you can see in pink, uh, these are the adapters that are loaded uh, on each one of the pod, and we need to decide how to route uh, this request, right? So if you go to the next slide. <coughs> so on traditional um, Kubernetes routing, we just pick a backend, right? We pick an endpoint, just route the request to this endpoint. But let's just um, assume we get a request for a lower adapter B, right? Uh, so the front end sends us a request requesting this lower adapter because this adapter is going to probably um, make uh, the inference response much better. Now, uh, the request is routed to the uh, leftmost pod, which has a lower adapter A loaded on it. So this pod will need to go ahead and load the lower adapter B, and this Leads, this, this case leads to uh, three main things, uh, which is reduced throughput, because while the pod is loading, is loading the adapter, it cannot process more requests for um, adapter A, which is already loaded. Uh, we have some additional latency um, to basically go ahead and load the adapter in. And we basically um, uh, inefficiently utilizing the hardware because um, if we just get one request for B, but B was uh, loaded right now, so then we have less memory uh, to basically process the requests because the adapter is not just um, uh, fast, like just gonna unload itself uh, in a fast manner, yeah. So this is just um, a high level of the solution uh, that LM Instance Gateway provides. Um, I purposely didn't include like specific resource names because A, it's still experimental, and uh, B, it's just uh, gonna be much longer slides to talk about. So if, I, um, if we have a request, and let's say the request is for adapter C, that I get is just observing this request, I need to decide um, how do I intelligently route this request to the pods with uh, adapter C already loaded. Um, so what the gateway is doing is it, um, routing the request through the Envoy X proc protocol um, to, basically an, to basically a server that is able to tell us uh, where the adapter is loaded on. And by that, uh, the gateway then um, route the request to the corresponding pod, which is in this case, Laura's uh, adapter C is loaded on uh, pod number three. And then the request is uh, successfully uh, routed to pod number three, and we could maximize the throughput um, and the hardware utilization by that. Now, again, this was a very, very high level. I know a lot of the things are new to a lot of people here. So I just put a very big um, um, barcode here uh, where you could scan and it will take you to the LLM Instance Gateway project, which um, is fully loaded with uh, links to the proposals and how you could deploy today and kind of play and provide feedback. So that's an overview of what's going on in SIG network being driven by AI ML workloads today, which is driving a lot of what's new. For, from here, what's next? Well, it's pretty open-ended, uh, but AI and ML really is driving a lot of what we're doing right now, no surprise to anybody, I imagine. 
Um, from us up on the stage, one of the things we would like to see is more native Kubernetes APIs be the actual elements that people interact with. So DRA is a good tool, but we would like to see it be more for the implementer and work more on higher level APIs so people that just need to be users of these things don't have to worry too much about the details. Um, and then anybody here who's interested in Kate's networking technology, whether it's just networking or not, um, or sorry, networking or AI related networking, um, should dig in and in particular what we need right now because we're going through this period of growth largely driven by AI ML workloads is uh, come tell us if it fits your needs. Is, is it intuitive to you? Is it, does it actually look right? We need your feedback. Um, if it doesn't look intuitive to you, that's bad and we need to know about it sooner rather than later so we can get ahead of it. Um, because pretty much everything that we talked about just now is new and experimental. And you could come in and help shape it yourself. Um, these are you know, all open process and stuff like that. And ultimately, the more people we can get involved, the better and the more well-rounded the solution is gonna end up being in the long run. If you'd like to get involved in any of these pieces, SIG Network in general, so we have mailing lists. These are for things that are kind of bigger things, you know, that go over longer periods of time or announcements and stuff like that. Would definitely uh, recommend that you subscribe to these. Just keep an eye on how things are going, but certainly feel free to post a topic in there if there's something on your mind. Um, the Kubernetes Slack, however, tends to just be very busy and where you can get a hold of a lot of people. Um, so if you're not on there, we recommend that you jump on there. Uh, the top QR code will get you to Kubernetes Slack, and in particular, related to the things that we talked today, we have the SIG Network channel, SIG Network Gateway API, WG Serving for the LLM Instance Gateway, WG Device Management for DRA. Um, don't hesitate to jump in there and just be like, hey, I'm new, this is something that I'm working on that might relate. Uh, you will get a response, and it's, you know, it's really pretty quick to get a response in Slack compared to like the mailing list. And then in general, if you just want to kind of join the meetings, that's usually the best way to get involved or just tune in even. You don't necessarily have to come in and say like, I have an agenda. You can just tune in and see what people are talking about. It'll be very enlightening. Um, and the year three meetings, you can just go to Kubernetes slash community and find the right SIG or working group. They'll all have a readme, but there's one for each of the working groups in the SIG we talked about. And then since we kind of established at the beginning of this that many people are uh, just coming to this completely fresh and new, this was probably pretty overwhelming for a lot of you. Um, and you might even leave, not even know where to start at all. We would recommend that if you're feeling like that, like this is just so far, I want to do something, but I can't even figure out where to start here. Um, go check out the CFCN, CNCF mentoring, like the contributors page, that's the bottom QR code. They can help you kind of find your way, get your foot in the door and kind of start to just, you know, get your feet wet. So that's it, we have time for questions. Yeah, we have time for questions and we would really appreciate if you could take some time to leave some feedback on our talk with that QR code. Hey, uh, this is uh, Arpit. I have a question regarding the the DRA for networking. Uh, you are not able to hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. So uh, does it like involve creating multiple virtual interfaces uh, before Node Bootstrap, or is like you on the fly you create these virtual functions uh, when the request comes? Because what I understood is that SRIOV creates the virtual functions at time of Node bring up, and then just simply allocates to everybody. Let me make sure I've um, got your question straight. Great question. So yes, you're right. Um, there's going to be the process on the node bring up. You're going to get the right drivers set. Those VFs are going to be created. And then what DRA is going to handle is um, having um, keeping tabs of what has been used and hasn't been used, right? So if you bring up a pod and it uses uh, one, um, one VF, then that's going to, that's going to be known. Um, and actually, you know, prior to DRA, there's actually a device plugin which is used. And device plugin 
is um, uh, sort of the, um, I guess, forebear to the current technology in um, device plugin, all that you got was just a count of what, um, what was available. And with DRA, there's actually going to be um, richer expressions of that kind of stuff. Does that help or uh, can you help me understand further your question? No, it, it helps. I understand it's like a bit of an evolving field as well. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Appreciate the question. Uh, I have a question regarding multi-networking. Um, is that includes VRFs inside the OpenShift or Kubernetes? Because the thing is, on our setup, we have SRUV, we have Maltus. We have some nodes doing acting as BGP speakers for specific networks. And we do not need a tenant to attach or modify their deployment to attach some networks. We need it to be transparent internally. Yeah, so uh, one quick differentiator here. Uh, we, we should talk after the talk, though, right? Because this is very, the question was OpenShift specific in, in how we do it. But one quick thing to note that the, the talk in here, which is the SIG network upstream, we still don't have the way to express multiple networks. We're working towards it. But uh, in OpenShift, it's a different story. So we, let's catch up after the, the panel and talk more. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, please. How do you manage the compatibility matrix between the hardware and the network interfaces? You know, there are several network cards that are new, like Connectix, and maybe it doesn't handle it like it's Ryobi. So, at least today, um, with the, the technologies that I am used to, is so under the Network Plumbing Working Group, we have an operator called SROV network operator, and that uses device plugin, which is kind of the, the current gen or and DRA kind of um, will eventually supersede that technology. But I believe that the SROV um, uh, network operator will do, um, will perform the kind of actions to make sure that you have the correct drivers loaded. Um, and um, functionality like that. I believe that it should generally work with the latest generation um, uh, ConnectX cards and uh, other. Um, so and so yeah. So the question is also Nvidia cards that are new. So I do believe that there are some exceptions here as well. So there are these um, DPU IPU cards which have a. Um, I'm probably going to butcher this, but I believe that it's like a system on a chip kind of functionality. So you'll have the network card, and that will actually be running an operating system on that card itself. Um, I definitely take a look through the schedule. I did notice that there was an IPU talk that's um, given by Balash Nemeth. And there's probably a lot more details on how that kind of functionality works. It's in the Intel booth in the pavilion, the project pavilion. He actually, yeah, he has it every evening at around 5.36, yeah. But I think to tie that back to in DRAs, do we have a way to do that yet? The hardware compatibility and exactly parameterizing what request you want to do it or... Um, I think that you're hitting on stuff that is going to wind up being defined. So I'm really glad that you that you bring that up, and I think it's something that we need to find out. And I also think that we're going to find a lot of the gaps with um, some of the work that um, Lionel is doing, who's sitting here in the front row and is to me uh, um, extremely valuable member of the community, and he's. Um, starting up this um, POC for this DRA CNI driver. And I think that that's going to wind up um, exploring a lot of this uh, surface to find out you know, where um, 
um, where these things are missing. And uh, hopefully, well, one, of course, we'll see how we can kind of integrate the current generation technology with the next generation technology, hopefully come up with standards that are better for developers, that are better for systems operators, um, but also I think that I, I'm, I am personally really interested in how some of the technology that we have, like SROV network operator, winds up working under a DRA kind of format. And I personally would really like to see that we take what is useful software that's used in production and a number of um, different Kubernetes distributions and m make that continue to be useful and also see a migration path um, for people here, because there are ways that make this possible, and hopefully we'll make it um, better in the next generation. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, we have one. Yes, one minute, and maybe that will uh, um, show how much I don't understand all of this. Uh, can you explain how DRA is connected to the multi-networking problem because even if like if for me like the area is like about resources like how do we manage resources and share resources and all of that but even if you use the area we will not have services for example on the interfaces and all of that so how all of this will be connected i'll take it and then you can you know add on yeah, that's actually a great question, and it's something that everybody in the community is also thinking, the, the aspect of how does all of this work and how does DRA help with multi-networks. I think as far as multiple networks are concerned, and correct me if I'm wrong, Doug, DRA is just the first step. It's providing an alternative way or another way in core to do what multis configs were doing, right? You could create the NAD and then put the config in the NAD to specify what you want and request it. We have that as part of the resource claim, a way to do that, a way to request that interface. So that is the piece of puzzle where it helps with multiple networks, but that is just one aspect of it. We need a way to attach that back to the network, but there is no network right now. So we need to work on that aspect first and then when we have the notion of network, we definitely need to work with the community in trying to make changes to services, network policies, and all the APIs to make them aware of those networks. Because every, everything right now runs under the assumption that the pod only has one IP, the pod only has that primary default network, and so you know we need to go further from there. I'm not sure if I answered the question here. You want to add something? Uh, yeah, um, I will. I'll just quickly add that number one, there's nothing to correct, Surya, you nailed it. And also, I don't think that the question um, betrayed your um, knowledge of the space. I think that is actually um, a very interesting question. And something I'd like to mention is that there's been a lot of challenges with the multi networking working group. We've had a cap that's out there for over two years. And this multi-networking is a problem we've been trying to solve in Kubernetes since 2016 or so, and maybe even predating that. So if you're interested in the area, it's certainly a place that people can get involved and have an impact. And one thing which I remember just now, actually Lionel also has a cap to be able to do services not directly in in core Kubernetes, because you don't have the concept of network yet, so that's the first step. But using NADs or using alternative ways, how can you unmanage your endpoint slice controller completely so that you don't create endpoint slices, endpoint slices in the default network, but have a way for an external controller to manage it? So there's there's this half solution, like what that, the cap will get us halfway there in being able to have the the concept of endpoint slices on a secondary network because you can have an external endpoint slice controller which manages that, right? So you're kind of decoupling it from core, but there's still work left to do. And, and, and I forget the cap number, but definitely talk to Lionel for services. Uh, okay, one, one more question. Um, so would this mean that ideally the second version or the next version of the next attached definition is 
based on DRA or is DRA or something like that? Uh, the multi-network working group is working through that problem weekly on uh, on Wednesdays to figure out exactly what this winds up um, looking like. So great question and definitely follow some of our links to uh, come check that out. And uh, yeah, we're kind of um, doing some thought experiments about how this winds up looking. What exactly are we going to specify as an object? What parts are useful or not? And how do we make it extensible as well? I ask the same question to Doug every week. Yeah, in many ways, what we're kind of trying to do here is more of a PSA. N not a lot of this is set in stone. So stay tuned, because this stuff is all new. I think we're out of time. Thank you, everybody. Please do leave feedback if you can take a second. We appreciate it. Have a good one. Thank you.